Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Axon Bulletin. It's Tuesday afternoon. I'm joined by Lawrence Conley, Natasha Miko, and it's myself, Declan McConville. Lawrence, you didn't join us last week. You've been a bit under the weather. How are you feeling, mate? Just the same, mate, but, you know, didn't want to go two weeks without having a chat with you. No, of course not. Um, there's a few people in the world like that. I was chatting to, to Jota and Friday, obviously, and then one with, with you two guys. So, yeah, it's a, a quick turnaround. I was looking for Paul McCartney yesterday. Nowhere to be seen. Natasha, how was your weekend in Sydney, London at Wimbledon and at Hyde Park? Yeah, it was great. Um, both of us down in London over the weekend, um, which was, the weather was great, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I went to see Adele at Hyde Park. I know not everyone's music taste, but for me, absolutely incredible definitely one of the best voices i've ever heard live and i know you were at hyde park the next day declan how was your trip yep it was great as you can see i've got my, my stones t-shirt on and mick jagger was actually at adele on uh, the saturday night when, when you were there so we were in quite good company he said that <laughs> and he came out but it was Probably absolutely brilliant two very different very concerts but um fun all the same yeah it was great. Um, weather was lovely and good old time. Uh, we had a few kind of catastrophic disasters, but don't need to go into them on here. Um, but I'll let you know about them. In hindsight, they're quite funny, but two cancelled trains to kind of kick it off is, yeah. is not the best of starts to a, a trip. But anyway, it's been a good week as a Celtic fan, uh, Lawrence. And, you know, I think that the topper of that week was getting our Portuguese winger in on the permanent deal. Um, I'm just kind of glad it's done now. Did, did, did you feel that same way? I was excited when it got announced. I was absolutely buzzing. I get even more buzzing when I spoke to him on Friday and he didn't understand me at first. But um, yeah, I'm just glad it's done and we can just kind of get on with more business now. Yeah, I mean, one of the top targets was, was retaining him. I mean, he's the only guy that has more holidays than you two. So <laughs> it's kind of, we're, we're, we're glad true. that he's, he's staying it, aren't we? So it's been a wee bit dragged out, but you know, he had to get his holidays out of the way. We had to get, come back. So I think when he's on holiday and we're on Celtic tops, the signs were all good. It was it was just like, let's just get him signed, get the new top launched, and then move on and uh, get some more people in the door. Because I think look, we could still do another three or four in. Yeah, there's plenty of room. I think if you probably look at the centre-half position, for example, obviously Starfield, he's travelled now to Austria. and He doesn't look to have taken part in training as of yet. So your only real cover in there is... Uh, Chris Julian, who's probably got one foot out the door. I know I've had a wee update on Instagram from him. Um, and so the kind of interaction that we get from Chris Julian and have done for nearly two years. And then you've got obviously Stephen Wells, Dane Murray, and Osazi Uragidi's back. But I don't see his counting in those type of players, do you, Natasha? No, I think um, the other one to add to that list is Lawwell is there as well. Yeah, I believe he's made the trip over. So um, he's another option at the back. But, you know, none of them, like you've touched on Declan, are... Um, proper first choice centre half options you know they're not really a like for like replacement for Starfell or Carter Vickers um, so I think it's definitely an area that we'll be looking to strengthen I think it's a shame that we've missed out on Ikatura I think he would have been a really strong option there but he probably would have been coming in as cover for Starfell and Carter Vickers you know you're looking at a player like him who clearly had a lot of options on the table um, to choose from, maybe it is going to be slightly harder to bring in a centre half like that when we already do have a very established pairing. Um, we spent a good chunk of the budget on one half of that pairing. Um, so anyone coming into that knows that that's going to be quite difficult to break up. Um, obviously for any footballer, that's part and parcel of the game. You are going to have to come into a new club and try and oust the player who's already in your position more times than not. But because we do have such a, a solid setup there, it might just be a slight turn off to, to any player coming into the setup. Yeah, I think I would like to see a good bit of position. Um, uh, sorry, a good bit of competition in that position, especially because we just don't have it. But as you say, Natasha, Vickers and Starfield, you know, last season were our two main men, and that doesn't look like shifting. And obviously, a big half of that budget, as you say. Six million has been shelled out in Vickers already, so he isn't for budging. And I don't expect this staff at injury to hopefully be too long. And we'll see him back. But again, we do have plenty of time, but not worrying about Champions League qualifiers kicking off in a week, which is where the position we'd likely be in, or a couple of weeks' time, or whatever it is now, um, because we've got that guaranteed entry. But, you know, before we get into the players in, players out, or it's one player we know that's definitely departed Celtic, 
It's Carol McCord and Bailey. He's away to, to France, to, to Brest. What, what's your take on this one? Because we were talking with Paul just before we came on air. And it's probably one of the biggest disappointments that you can remember, you know, in God knows how many years. But, you know, talk a super kid coming into this team. We saw him come into the team, make competitive appearances. He obviously, uh, I remember coming coming on under Neil Lennon towards the end of that eighteen nineteen season and thinking, you know, could next year be his uh, big year? I know he's had injury issues, but this is a bit of a, a, a disappointment, really, if you look at Celtic's overall youth structure. And I'm not really making any kind of massive impact in the first team. Well, you, there was a lot of excitement. Was it 12 or 13 played for the under-18s? You're thinking... 13. Yeah. The, the boy's a player. You know, you, you see the YouTube clips. You know, there's rumours he fell out with, with Lenny, wasn't there? In uh, pre-season, he got a chance under Ange, and he, he looked really good until that horrible, horrible tackle on his ankle, uh, and it put him out. And I think that's one so disappointing because I'm not too sure he wanted to leave, you know, that... You're looking at Dolk and Hepburn, that those are guys that chose to leave. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is his career just seemed to stall the season before last, and then he got the injury and it stalled it again. And, and I think he really is what I've because he wanted to stay and play. Whereas a lot of the other ones they chose to leave. So yeah, huge disappointment. I think it's best he's away to just you know, wish him all the best. It, it, I think he'll he'll have a great career in the game. I think if he gets his chance in the run of games, he you know he's going to be an exciting player for whatever team he plays for. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Natasha. We're not talking about somebody here that's twenty eight or something. You know, this there's still plenty of time for Karamoko Dembele to develop, and I think we have you know a full season under his belt. God mm-hmm. knows where it could go. I don't know if there'll be anything included from Celtic's part on this. We can sell on fear or anything, but. Um, yeah, you know, I'd like to have seen him included at a point. Obviously, Lawrence touched on there, bad, bad injury, and it maybe could have been his season under Ange, but not to be for, for Karim O'Good and Bailey. Yeah, it's a shame for him, really. Um, and we are talking about his age here, but, you know, he's still he's only, what, a year younger than Abada? You know, so he isn't that young anymore. And he never really managed to fulfil his potential for me at Celtic, and it just hasn't quite worked out. I think I agree with you both. I think the injury came at a really bad time. I said at the start of the season that he was one of the players that I was quite excited about, seeing where they got to under Ange, seeing their development, because I think this was going to be a really important season for him and his development. And unfortunately, that just wasn't the case. And if we're looking forward to next season, then I suppose there's a few ways of looking at it now, the way that things went. He's never going to get into the squad ahead of the wingers that we have at the moment. You know, he's not going to come and take the position from Jota or Abada or Forrest. We've got Maeda and Kyogo who can play it wide. We've got so many well-established, very good options out there. So he was probably looking at that himself and thinking, you know, my football time is going to be very limited. My chances are going to be very limited. Maybe this is no longer the best club for me to try and re-establish my career at or establish a career, I suppose it's not particularly established yet at all. So, yeah, probably a good decision for him, for his footballing sense, to go and um, play somewhere else. Um, But he has been disappointing, and I don't know why he hasn't really managed to fulfil that potential, because now, you know, he's been at the club a long time and he's had the opportunity under four different managers, really, if you look at it. He was played under Rodgers, then Lennon, Kennedy for a bit, now Ange. And none of them have taken the chance to give him a run in the team. You know, so that's either an indication for all of them, ability-wise, he wasn't quite up to it at the right time. I know there's certainly been rumours of attitude-wise, he hasn't been quite up to it. But that's, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to blame his attitude. I don't know him, we don't know him, we don't see him in training every day. And I think that's just a bit of a weak argument that gains a bit of momentum the more people say it. But there's certainly a reason that he hasn't featured under any of these managers properly. Um, and I'm just being clear, if a player doesn't want to be here, doesn't want to play, he's not interested in him. But for me, I think what really went wrong for Dembele as the tagline says is the injury at the start of the season I think that's what really finished off any notion that he could establish his career here and like Lauren said wish him well and uh, hope he finds success Yeah I'll be interested to see what um, direction his career moves in I mean at 19 years of age it's it is really only just beginning for him and I think you know under Ange Natasha there was a big reset button pressed at Celtic Park and everybody had an opportunity 
Um, and he was certainly given that opportunity in the pre-season friendlies. There was a lot of guys just coming back from internationals. It wasn't a, a full squad that we had and we had lots of guys going out the door, so he probably would have got his chance in. That might have been when he made you know, the big breakthrough, if you will. I know he scored in uh, Scott Brown's last game at Celtic Park and it looked maybe as if next season could be his season, but but not to be. Um, but Lawrence, I think this kind of a move to France, a, a team that finished 11th last year in the game, it's a good move for him and it'll be interesting to see if it kind of develops on here if he does get regular football too. Yeah, I think if he stays injury free, he will. Um, you know, France is it's probably suiting for, for all parties. Natasha's touched on it. He's not going to displace the wingers we've got. He really needs minutes in his legs. Uh, and I think, you know, they're, they're kind of mid-table, aren't they? So he should be getting plenty of minutes there. And hopefully he, he, he's a great career in the game. It, it's just really sad because... You know, some of the players that left have chosen to leave, and I, I don't think that was his choice. He, he stayed to an age where he should really have been in and about the first team. And some have, have left before, you know, whether it's Bayern Munich or Liverpool or Watford, who have had players go to. It, it, it's just disappointing. Some that really wanted to make it Celtic, it just hasn't worked out. And he's had all that, that hype. And you can see he, he's definitely got a football and brain and ability. It, it, it's just I mean that ankle injury last pre season. Because it, it really was lighting up the preseason games, and you're thinking, you know what, Angie's got the, the reputation developing youth. We didn't have a, a a huge squad at that point, so you thought this boy's going to get minutes, and and hopefully we'll see we'll see what he can do. But yeah, wish him all the best. Yeah, absolutely, wish him all the best. And you know, I think the taxi was talks around also that kind of loan deal to Queens Park, which is supposedly. Knocked back, and um, that came out. But uh, again, we don't know him, we don't see him in training. And again, it's ultimately a, a footballing decision made on the part of Ange Postecoglou. And with everything he's did in the past season, we trust his judgment on these things. But it will be interesting to see how he kicks on. Just in terms of that, Natasha, in terms of learning lessons from youth players going, maybe not being given the chance in the first team, I'm hoping just now that we're, we're coming to the end of that kind of stage where you've not seen the direct pathway into the first team. And the under Ange Postecoglou, there is that chance. Obviously, Ben Doak, one of the guys uh, featured, I do imagine that we'll see players, you know, trickling into the first team during this uh, pre-season. But uh, again, somebody like that is Aaron Hickey, who I'm sure will will come on just just shortly. But would you agree with that? You wouldn't see that that pathway there. Obviously, they need to be good enough, but there does need to be a pathway in place. Yeah, I think last season Angie's main priority was obviously the rebuild. That was well documented. He had a huge task on his hands in rebuilding the first team squad um, on the pitch. And he didn't really change too much in terms of backroom and off the pitch and things like that. His focus was on the pitch and we all agree with that and it worked out very well because we know how last season went. Now he seems to have taken this last couple of months to turn his attention to the other elements of the the club as a whole, if you like, not just on the pitch things. We've seen that he's had a bit of a reshuffle in his backroom team. He's brought people in. He's looking for analysts. And one of these things is that he's moved Stephen McManus down to the B-team squad. Um, I say down to the B-team squad. That's probably the wrong word. Along to the B-team squad, let's say that, because it is essentially meant to be a pathway. Um, And I think that'll help. I think that'll help with the pathway that we've been talking about. Um, Someone who's now spent, you know, a season training with Ange and the first team and learning how they do things and understanding that, he now takes that to the B-team squad and makes sure that they're training and playing and progressing in exactly the same way that the first team players are under Ange. So even just to have that similarity makes it a much easier step for the players in the B-team to then play for the first team and hopefully it should bring them along and improve their ability as well. So if we're able to show them that, if we're able to show them a bit of a clearer path, then we perhaps lose less players like Ben Doak, like you've touched on, and, and they are more keen to stay at Celtic and see this as the best option for progressing their career. And if you look at the, the trip we're on now over in Austria and look at the number of players that have gone from the B team, if you like, um, I believe that Rocco Vata is there, touched on Blossom Lovell is there. So the fact that these players are going away with the first team, training with them, they're obviously going to get a chance to feature in the preseason games that we're going to play out there. Um, and that in and of itself makes them the pathway to the first team a lot clearer for them. And if they take their opportunities and they make the most of them, then maybe these are the sort of players we'll see getting a chance in the first team during the season. Yeah, it's you know it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You know, I think Gary Melrose here hits it on the head, saying he was a victim of circumstance mm-hmm. last season. Um, it could have been a breakthrough season, but the leg break and a close title race stopped that. 
Ange Postacoglu won't play him if he didn't commit to the last six months out to, yeah, totally agree with that. John Boyle's coming to say there's not enough being said about the horrendous tackle in a pre-season friendly. It, it was a terrible challenge, you know, mm-hmm. for a friendly. It was an awful, awful challenge. And it basically did kill his season for, for Celtic this year because I, I really do think he could have kicked on. Um, there's, a, there's a few other comments coming in here. Robert Highlands, who's a user to choose to contribute, are saying he would rather have seen Dembele feature than James Forrest, who's obviously had his issues with, with injuries um, in recent times. Uh, other comments coming in to say that they're disappointed to see Dembele go as they were looking forward to seeing him more in the first team. But we're not going to get to see that chance, but it's about moving on. And I think, you know, as you say, Natasha, it's about giving this new batch of talent, you know, a, a chance uh, over in Austria and seeing what they can do. You know, I, I was impressed with Dane Murray last year when he came in against Midgieland. We've not seen him since. Um, again, victim of circumstances due to that. And obviously there's players like Adam Montgomery who spent season last season on Monty Aberdeen. Um he's you know, he's one I think could possibly be for the future as well. So people like that we want to keep a, a, a close eye on. Obviously he's been out alone again, but people like this we want to probably keep a big close eye on. Lawrence in terms of, you know, learning lessons and whatnot, Aaron Hickey looks as if he's gonna make the move to the Premier League to Brentford. We know all about Brentford, we know all about their system. Obviously, Chris Iyer went down there after being being looked at for a, a long, long time. And it looks as if it's going to rise to round about what Tony's saying here, nearly twenty two million pounds. Celtic made four hundred and fifty grand out of the deal to Bologna from Hearts. Um, I don't think they're, they'll make anything out of this one, but again, it's probably a bit learning a lesson as well as that maybe acting a bit faster. In the transfer market, which hasn't been an issue under Ange Postecoglou, but we've been quick with business. But I know we did have a good look at, at Hickey. What's your take on this one? Again, I'm pleased for this as a Scottish international being trusted to go for big money once again. With uh, some interesting fullbacks come through the club, Kieran, Andy Robertson, Aaron Hickey. So, whatever the fullback coaches were doing, you, you, you know, they're doing something right. Uh, I, th- I think at the time we let them go to Hearts. I don't think there was too many people disputing that decision, was there? Uh, and it was... I, I'm not too sure how open he was to rejoining Celtic uh, but from Hearts. Uh, you certainly, if you're in a and looking well, well, I went to Italy and I've now secured myself a £22 million pound move, you might have think, you know what, I've I've done a... You know, made a decent choice in my career. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not too sure... It, it was a case of us acting quicker. I, I think he got that opportunity in Italy. I'm not too sure he was convinced he was going to be a starter back at Celtic. He, he knew he would be in Italy, and it's worked out really well for him. Shame he didn't make a wee bit more cash out of it, but, you, you know, what what can we do? Not, not every player that comes through the, the, the ranks is going to make it, or even the ones that do have a decent career we're going to afford to take off. You're going to have, space, have to have space in the team to say that you're going to get minutes. Uh, and we can't do that with everybody. I think there was a few ahead of Hickey, and there wasn't too many people saying, ah, we shouldn't have let our boy go to Hearts. I think everybody was kind of happy with the deal at the time. Yeah, well, he's developed at Hearts, and obviously, as you say, he's got his move out to Serie A, and now he's heading for, for the English Premier League, but I think there probably is lessons in this one to be learned, Natasha. It all goes back to what you were saying about you know pathways as well. Lawrence does touch on there that um, you know, at the time, probably nobody was saying anything. I certainly, you know, until his break for hearts, I hadn't heard of him. But there's people in positions at Celtic and youth car- academy positions that must have noticed uh, something. But I, again, I think it's good that the Scottish market's getting trusted again. And mm-hmm. on this one, you know, but probably not going to benefit out here at all financially. Now, I imagine hearts will probably get a decent win for like a few million quid. But um, in terms of just a Scottish player going for a, a big load of money at the Premier League, it's a positive thing to see. Yeah, it's just good for, for Scottish football. And, and what I would say about this one is I think it was a very good move, a very brave move of Hickey to choose to go out to CDA. It's not the most common route for, for a young Scottish player. and um, We've seen it work well for, for some of our own you know, other players like Henderson and things like that. And I think it's always a, a brave thing when they choose to go down, maybe not the beaten path, try something a bit different. Um, and it's really worked for him. I don't know where he could have went from Hearts that would have eventually seen him at Brentford in this sort of short period of time. So maybe it encourages more young players to to take a slightly different route, try something different um, and see where their career goes. Because, you know, at the same time, he was still a very young guy when he moved 
away over to to Italy um you know put left Scotland for the first time living in his own you know that's that's a brave move so credit to him for doing it um and as much as I'm saying you know it's great for Scottish football it's you know good to maybe encourage more players to take that sort of route try something different I'm not particularly keen on any of our youth academy deciding that's a good route um I'd like to see them stay at Celtic but um yeah credit to Hickey and I hope it works out well for him yeah, I hope it works out really well for him um, out there. It'll be a, an interesting one to keep your eye on. Um, and he goes to Brentford if he is going to get first team football. Obviously, Brentford did pretty well last season, just coming up and mm-hmm. kind of cementing their, their place in the Premier League. So, yeah, want to keep your eyes on. Um, Lawrence, a, a player from Celtic's past, which just seems to, well, I say past, and I'm talking a couple of months here, but he's no longer a Celtic player. Is Tom Rodgick. Yet to get a club, obviously, in the Beatons, went back to his homeland. But from today's comments, um, there seems to be a bit of concern that he's snubbed Graham Arnold after being left out. Well, didn't travel to the Peru game for the playoff game due to personal reasons. And now Graham Arnold's came out and uh, I think it's Fox News over the noise. Not lambasted him, but he's basically, you know, had a word and he seems to be in the bad books for the Aussie team, which isn't too good for Celtic in terms of finances coming from this World Cup because if he doesn't go, Celtic are probably going to miss out on a few hundred grand. It, yeah, if it's personal reasons he's not went for, I, I don't know what they are. So I, I suppose you need to say yeah, it's hard to comment, isn't it? We, we, we don't know what's what's happening. If it's personal reasons, it's keeping him away. I'm surprised he's not got a club. I mean, I'm surprised when he we chose to leave it into some, something lined up or his advisor didn't have something lined up for him. But you know, I wouldn't expect him to, the, the season to start and him not to have a club. But we'll, we'll see because it, it's really hard. We don't know what the personal reasons are that are. You know, he's choosing not to play football, so hopefully it's nothing too serious. Yeah, it's a bit of a strange one, this Natasha, because you know, yeah. you don't expect the players' international manager to come out when the players not went to a game for personal reasons. I, I hope that Graham Arnold, you know, knows what, what those are, but he's came out and he's had a real good dig at him here in the press. Yeah, um, it was a strange decision for him not to go to the World Cup playoff games. Those were obviously absolutely massive for Australia. We saw how that all panned out and it couldn't have been tighter, you know, the chances of them getting to the World Cup or not. And I know that a lot of the Australians over there, a lot of supporters of the national team, regard Tom Rogic as one of their best players, if not the best player in the squad, he can really change a game. So for them to have to go into a game like that without their top talent, and relatively no explanation, you can understand why a lot of the Australian football fans are a bit frustrated by that. Obviously, he said it's personal reasons. He doesn't have you know any obligation to divulge what those are. But equally, to be missing your best player for such an important game is frustrating. So the guys on the pitch are left to do the job. They do the job. Well done to them. They're going to the World Cup. But now, which one of them has to lose their place in, you know, the World Cup squad to a guy who didn't want to turn up for the qualifiers. So, you know, if you look at it on that hand, you can understand why there could be a bit of unease, unrest, unhappiness. Um, And I think from the manager, I think from Graham Arnold, this is probably a bit of a warning to Tom, you know, get this sorted, um, turn up, tell us what's going on, or there will be no World Cup place for you. And it seems crazy to me that the Rogic is gambling with a World Cup place because surely every player's dream is to, to play in the World Cup. Um, I know that he is still in Glasgow. He's still staying um, in his, his house in Glasgow. He's been spotted out recently with James Forrest, with Scott Bain. Um, his family are still over here. So it seems like he's just staying put at the moment while he works out his next move. But he needs to really start working out what that next move is going to be. Um, I'm surprised that he didn't have options lined up when he made the decision to leave Celtic at the end of the season. Um, but I, for his sake, I hope he finds something soon. For the national team's sake, I hope he finds something soon and that he can now move on in the next month or so, get himself settled at a club and get some football under his belt before then going away to, to Qatar with Australia. Yeah, I think probably at the back of his mind will also be getting that, that fitness kicked up. And I, I did read... I remember that it was potential that he might come back and just train myself just to try and keep him in good shape. I was obviously, I don't think he's travelled to, to Oz City, you know, just train me with Celtic, but whether he's still maybe doing a bit of work at Lennox too, just to try and keep um, himself in shape and just to look after him, I don't know. But we really do hope it uh, works out as a success for Tom Rojuk and I hope he does go to the World Cup because, you know, it's 
a once in a lifetime opportunity for them to go and do that and um it most definitely deserves it. So be interested to see how, how that one pans out. Um in terms of midfielders, Lawrence, one midfielder who are we kind of continually getting linked to is uh, Venetius Souza. Now it looks as if now that Schalke and Real Betis are now in the race to sign the midfielder. We've already heard Ajax, Fenerbahce. We're up against a lot of teams here, but we do have this link to the city group which could swing it in our favour. What's your take on this one? Because it seems to be uh, rumbling on a good bit now. C- certainly recently, uh, the papers get very few right <laughs> when it comes to Celtic and the signing targets. So I-, I don't know what to make of it, if it's just paper talk, because Ange and Nicholson seem to move quickly in the market. So this would not be the way they normally operate, if it was true. Uh, so do the papers have nothing to print? Are they after them? You know, we've got a lot of defensive midfielders at the club. You know, where's he going to fit in then? You know, you could say, well, Cal moves further forward, he starts. Well, what about Gucci, McCarthy, Scott Robertson's back? Is it the, the area we want to be focused on strengthening? I'd suggest we, you know, centre half next. Maybe another striker if we can move a, y- a Yeti on. It, it just seems a, an area we've got maybe three or four players already that can play that position for us. Are we really going to go right and mix targets? Another one that can play that position, and I get that you know it frees Callum up, but I, I think there's a bit of paper talking it. I'm not sure that we. I'm going to come in and disagree with Lawrence there because I think we do have players who play in that position. You've touched on Gucci, um, McCarthy, Scott Robertson, so we do have players who play there. But I don't think we've got any players who have shown themselves to be at the level we need to play there for the next campaign and for the Champions League. Um, so yeah, there's players in that position, but I don't think I would put any of them comfortably into the first game of next season. Um, so I think oh, for me, Cal. that is our next position to challenge on and to to build on is the this sort of central defensive midfield role that perhaps you know a Wanyama played that maybe in his time Beaton could have played that Brown occasionally dropped back into. I think that's the role that we don't have covered sufficiently, and I think that's probably what Souza could fit, or if not him, then someone else. And I'm sure that the and his backroom team are, are on the hunt for that. But for me, I think that's probably would be my next target. Yeah, I, I would agree Callum with Natasha. There, there, there is, yeah, Callum can play. There is mixed uh, chat about this in the, the, the old comments, which is good. We've got a bit of debate in here. Boone Warriors came in, Laura, to see he agrees with you. Patrick also says that he thinks his Celtic midfield is strong enough. Um, but th- this is my take on it. Beaton's left the club. We need a Beaton replacement out there. Probably trusted near B20 to play in the Champions League. If you're asking me if I didn't, Callum McGregor gets injured, if I trust James McCarthy as Malia Soro, yet to see enough of Yusuke Adeguchi, so it's no harm to him because of his, his injury. Um, and Scott Robertson, again, I've yet to see enough of him in a Celtic jersey. I'd probably say I don't trust any of them as of yet. So for, for me, I, I think Ange wants an oven ready player that can play this position. And he just might be the man. Lawrence, are you at the point then that you think that we don't need a number six, but we're already covered in that yes. area? Or that the only reason my... we go out and get one is we need to shift some first? So I would have a priority another striker before another number six. Uh, you know, I think Ange is on record as saying he got midfielders in because he knew Beaton and Roger were leaving. So that's why he brought O'Reilly and Gucci in. So... From that, I would take it that those were Angie's replacements for those two players. Mm-hmm. Uh, we really struggled when Kyogo was out uh, and Yakamakis was out, you know. So I don't think it's going to happen for a Yeti. I know he's away training. I think we is possibly, yeah, my next target would be another striker. Uh, but, you know, we we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, I think Gucci's been brought in by Ange as a defensive midfielder, I think. Uh, Callum can play it. It'd be great to see him further forward. What's going to happen with McCarthy? You know, he, he's got three years of a four-year deal left. He's played at top level before. You know, if you've got a choice just now for me between getting a defensive midfielder and a striker in, I would go and get another striker before another defensive midfielder. Natasha, what's your take now? Striker mm. before a defensive midfielder? Good. I was actually... I think we're going to have to disagree again. That's a good point. Yeah. There is a, there is a point in it that there's probably more cover in that position than we do have. You know, if Kyogo or Yakimakis gets injured, you're back to probably looking at one of the wingers up front. But I really do think we need a number six for getting into the Champions League. Yeah. I think we're, I think we're almost, I think we're more covered in the striking department than we are um, in a sort of number six 
obviously we've got Kyogo, we've got Jack Marcus, Maida can play up there, Abada can play up there, um, Ayeti can play up there, and if you know Lawrence is going to like bring up some of the youth players like Robertson for the number six, then we've got players like Dawson who can play up front from the B team. You know, so I think yeah, they're not they're not players that uh, towards the end of that list that I would put up there, you know, out of choice, but. I think we probably are better covered up front than we are in the sort of defensive midfield position. Would it be nice to have another striker to to back up Kyogo and Giacomakis? Yes. Will we do that? Maybe. But would I focus on number six first? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, would, I would focus on number six. But, you know, it seems, you know, it could just be paper talk. So we could pull one out of the bag here. Um, but... Yeah, but I, I do think we need one um, and I do think we are probably going to move people on in that department. But, you know, by all accounts, James McCaffrey's came back, looks in a lot better shape, but there's still a big question mark as to, you know, whether Ange Postecoglou really did want James McCaffrey at that point in time. But any time, you know, I've watched him uh, latterly come on in the Celtic jersey, I think he's played very well for the club, so it's just about him keeping fit and getting the other games um, in there. But, Lawrence, you know, if Souza is the target and he is the man, it looks as if it could be a loan with an option to buy. Would that be something that you think could happen now? You know, Celtic's next spend around about eighteen million pounds. We've already used that loan with option to buy Del Well and Maeda, Vickers and Jota now. Um that would seem like the the sensible thing to do at this point in time, probably. Yeah, I think we'll be looking at loans to options and buy to buy unless we can move some people out. We've spent quite a bit of money. Uh, you know that the board are uh, prudent, if nothing else. So I think unless, you know, maybe move Julian or Yeti on, that'll free up two big wage earners. You might see them go and spend then. Until they move somebody like that on, I think it'll be loans with options to buy. You know, there'll be a loan fee, but it'll be a lot less than the, the purchase fee. So, yeah, I, I I could see them doing that. But let's say it's just been really uncharacteristic for suit of them. From what we know, Andrew Nicholson seem to get deals done really quickly and the press generally don't have a sniff. So, yeah, so for two things that I'm kind of looking at going, well, the press seem to know all about us and it's taking ages. Yeah, well, it, it does seem to be a strange one. As you say, it usually is quick business and it gets done quickly. Obviously, you know, this is a player who is under the, the City Group. Um, his parent club are owned by the City Group in Belgium. They were taken over um, two years ago um, to be the City Group's ninth team, so I don't know if there could be anything. And that, again, Lawrence, as you say, it could just be that connection, and that's what the, the tie is. But going by reports, Celtic have already spoken to the players' representatives, and that is the deal on the table. It's actually just to kind of go back to an Anthony Joseph update nearly a month ago now. He said that we were in talks with Benjamin Segrist. That's now done. He put a tick beside Vickers. That was when it was done. We were monitoring a uh, Taylor Harwood, Bellis, Itakura and others. Obviously, Itakura is now a way to Gladbach, so we're still probably looking for a set of half. Left-back, Tick, the defensive central midfielder, we were on the lookout, supposedly. Jota had a timer beside it. That's got a Tick now and a market, and a striker is in the market. Um, are we, are we still in agreement that the defensive central midfielder is probably the priority here rather mm-hmm. than our striker just now? Yeah, I, th- I, I think so for the reasons that I've outlined. But I think what that list shows... Um, and the way that we've ticked it off there is that we're going about our business very, very well in this transfer market. Um, we appear to be very strategic about it, very focused on what we're doing, and very early about what we're doing as well, which is nice, the way that we're ticking them off um, strategically and in good time, because you know we've, we've still got a good amount of time to, to have the pre-season, to have the training camp, um, to come back, and we don't have the qualifiers. You know, so there isn't a particular rush for, you know, qualifiers or anything like that, which we've sort of missed the deadline on before. Um, but what we are doing is just getting about our business quickly so that these players can join up for the pre-season camps and for the pre-season games. And I think that's one thing that's really impressed me about um, Ange and Michael Nicholson as well, is the way that we're going about our business quickly. And also the way that that's not being, you know, mostly, you know, too dragged out or prolonged. Um, you don't read about in the press for weeks before it happening or not happening, or we do tend to just be focused on going after our players. Yes, Carter Vickers and Jota seem to take a little bit of time to get announced, but actually they didn't really. The guys are on holiday, they had time off, and the minute they were back, it got done. You know, it was that simple. So there doesn't seem to be any, you know, long drawn out transfer sagas. Um, yes, Ikatura went somewhere else, fine, we move on, we find someone else. Um, 
Um, yes, yeah, so I'm pretty pleased with the way that the, the club are handling the business in this transfer market. We just have to, to look back in previous seasons to see how that hasn't been the case. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going well for me and just to keep ticking off that, that list that you ran through there. Yeah, um, Lawrence, in terms of you know the strikers, a position, because I do think there's a real point to this. Do you see Celtic going and getting another striker if Albion Agate can't get shifted this window? It's a sticking point. He's on big wages, isn't he? But but there is a, a certain striker with a well-known name that's available on a free transfer at the moment. So I'm sure we'd all welcome Jordan to the club. Uh, being on a free transfer, he's going to going to look for a, a, an uptick in his wages. So. Uh, yeah, he's done okay away against Betis. It really depends what 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 Ange sees on him. He obviously sees Kyogo Yakamakis is his first and second choice. Any striker coming in, I suppose, similar to a centre half that comes in is going to have to say, can't displace one of them. And I mean, uh, Big John talking about it because he came in and it was Larson and Sutton, and it, it, he was kind of saying to Ariel, you know, how am I going to get a game in front of these guys? Are you going to give me a chance? So I suppose any top level strikers. Going to have that same, same query, so I think it was going to be Jordan Larson. He's going to be having that chat with Ange, isn't he? Going, well, if Kyogo and Yakimakis are strikers, where's my chance coming? Given that generally when we play one striker, it's probably a harder task than John Hartson was facing. You know, he was going for one or two positions, so yeah, I, I think it's the level of striker that would come in if a yet is still here. And then if he moves on, it's who we can attract. We can obviously afford a better level, but it's their attitude to having to fight for the jersey over of a Yakimakis and Kyogo. But Angie seems to be a really good judge of attitude so far, doesn't he? So we've just got to you know trust Ange that he knows what he's doing. Yeah, um, Natasha, do you see this as a sticking point? You know, five million pound they moved to Celtic. Four from West Ham, I imagine he's probably an upwards of 20, 25 grand a week, probably, at Celtic. Um, you know, if we can move Vasilis Barkas out the door, um, who I think had a howler at the weekend against Queen's Park, and they get absolutely gubbed 4-2, um, surely we can move anybody out the door? Yeah, exactly. Um, one of my key concerns about moving some of the the fringe players on who weren't getting the chance. We're talking Barkas, we're talking Ayeti, probably talking Soro, and um, players like that. My concern was who's going to come in for these guys? You know, which club is going to come in and, and pay money for a player who hasn't played for you know a good period of time? They've almost the opposite of being in the shop window. They have not been on display at all. So how how or why would the club come in and purchase one of those players? It's happened for Barkas. Obviously, they've not bought him. It's a it's a loan move, um, which is, you know, at least it gets the the wages, um, you know, partly covered, I suppose. But my concern is finding clubs for these players to go to. And similarly as to what we've done with Barkas, I think when it comes to maybe a Yeti, we might have to consider just cutting our losses at this stage. Um, we're paying him significant amounts of money every single week. At least try and get a significant portion of that off the wage bill. If it's a loan deal, if we have to accept a loss on, on whatever we manage to sell them on for, I think now it's just important to, to move them out the door, recoup what we can, because we're not going to be able to get any more for a Getty than we are right now during this transfer window. It's not like he's going to go in and have a great six months for us and his stock's going to go up and someone's going to come in and pay more money. All that's going to happen in the next six months is that he's going to have six months less on his contract. So we're not going to get any more for a Yeti than we're able to sort of recover right now. So for me, I would just be looking to move him off the books for, for whatever we can manage to bring in the door. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And it's, again, you know, trying to move on from the mistakes made in the past here. You know, big, big fees for players that just haven't worked out um, at all. So, yeah, it's an interesting one to see. We've just comments come in here to see that Bolly Ball and Goalie's been linked if I move to Reading. Um, again, that's another one that will probably be on high wages, but we've moved quickly there. Obviously, we've not been on since uh, last week. Lawrence, um, I know you've not joined us in two weeks. Um, Alexandro Bernabe, um, this has been a really tough one. I know you're a big Greg Taylor fan like myself, but I think it's important that we've got competition um, in that area. And again, this guy's going to develop, and I think it's going to be good for Greg Taylor too. You know, competition is healthy. Yeah, definitely. You, you know, left-backs... Looking good now, you know, we'll move scales out, rumours Bolly's going. 
you've got two exciting young talents that have got room to, room to develop. And, uh, you know, Taylor's game, I think, raised over the season last, last year. So it's his shot at the moment, isn't it? So he, he'll be determined to keep a hold of it. So hopefully it pushes him on as well. And at the same time, the, the new Argentinian kid's going to want to get, get the shot. So let's hope it's healthy for them and uh, they can push each other on to higher levels. Yeah, Natasha, I'm really, really excited about this one. You know, from what I've watched of him out there at Atlantis in Argentina, he looks a player. Um, it's quite ironic that, you know, his, his last uh, kind of moment in a, a jersey out there is headbutt and something getting sent off. But hopefully he's, he's learned to be a, a harsh lesson from that and doesn't try anything similar like that um, in Scotland because I'm sure referees won't have any uh, hesitation in sending him off. But this is what I'm excited about. I think he gives us something that we've maybe not had too much, something that Greg Taylor's you know, kind of developed into. But, you know, he's definitely going to get down that left-hand side. And it'll be great to see him link up with the... Uh, Dyson in Maeda, you know, two absolute speed merchants on that side. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, I also like that he's obviously got a bit of passion, a bit of fight, maybe slightly too much from time to time, but I think his sending off is a little harsh. I think the other player made the most of it. Um, but yeah, a, a good lesson for him to have just before he comes over here, that he certainly would not get away with that in Scottish football, so maybe let's not be trying any of that again. But in terms of, you know, the passion, the determination, I'm all for it. Um, and you know, no discredit to, to Greg Taylor. He's done well in that position. Um, I think he got better and better as the season went on. I think he had some very good performances and very big games. But like we've already touched on, competition is so important. You know, we need we need Greg Taylor to think this is my shirt and I don't want to lose it, so I'm going to perform at 110%. And we need our new boys to come in and think, well, that's what I've come here to do, is to get that shirt and make that position my own. So he wants to be fighting for it as well. And that's just healthy. And I think for both of the players, they'll recognise that that's good for them. It's good to have that competition. And yes, Greg Taylor came in and, and did fine. He did well in some games. But there's always ways to improve. You need to be looking at every position on the pitch and wondering how you can improve it. You know, we've seen before, you can't rest on your laurels. You need to keep striving to improve. There's no point stagnating. And if we can improve our left-back position with Burnaby, which I think we can, then that's great. And I'm excited to, to see what he can come in and do in that position. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And it's exciting when, you know, the, the players that have brought in really do excite me. I know two of them um, were with his last season but just having him in the door permanently just I think gives everyone a lift and it, it just improves your squad massively um, and really really excited to see him just where we kind of touched on uh, Redden there in the, the comments earlier on Lawrence saying today they've, they've launched a campaign they've, they've written to all the other clubs in the English Championship um, to say that they will only charge away fans 20 quid um, if it's reciprocated from the, the you know other clubs and they're like, now this is obviously not something that's new. Um, if ourselves at Celtic boys did this at, towards 2019, 2020 campaign, when they, they put up a lot of terrific banners, you know, outlining how much it was going to cost Celtic's fans going along to the games. Um, and, you know, I think this is a good step. It's good to see that it's happening in English football. Cardiff, Blackburn and Huddersfield are the other teams who have already agreed to it. And the, the offer is open to, to others. Um but personally, I, I just can't see this happening here in Scotland. You know, I think we've moved so far away from this. And it's not just pointing the finger at an 11, and at all the other 11 teams in the league. I think also the, the price at Celtic charge at times is, you know, over the mark. And especially due to the circumstances that people are facing just now. So I think it's a really positive step from Reading as a football club. I think it's an easier step for Reading to get more TV money for starters. So I think... For Celtic, it's a bit hard. You know, we're talking about who, who we should buy and get this player in and get that player in. Well, Celtic's funding mainly comes from ticket sales. So, yeah, drop the price. Drop the standard of players that's coming in. That's unfortunately the Scottish model. The TV money's so bad. So, I think it's completely different. Someone, you know, a couple of clubs down south doing it that make an absolute fortune off a of TV compared to Celtic when that's our main revenue stream. I, and... Are we going to get a better TV deal soon? I know the kind of the broadcasting of games is is going to end your own the club TVs, so that's going to cut TV revenue again. You'd imagine. So, yeah, I can't see us us cutting prices until we can get revenue from elsewhere and re reliable re revenue, not just saying well, we've got Champions League this season. Let's cut ticket prices a wee bit for league games. It, it needs to be something sub sustainable for us. How they're going to do that, I, I, I don't know. So I just can't see us dropping to 20. 
it, it's the same for the other clubs in the league. They're ex, you know, they get less TV money than us. So it's, I, I don't think Reading and it, it, or the English market and the Scottish market is kind of fair to judge on, on the price of the tickets just because there's such a disparity in TV money. Natasha, what's your take on this? Obviously, you know, I think if you look outside the league, you know, outside of both Glasgow teams, Hearts have sold out their season tickets. You do see, I think Cubs have did okay their season ticket sales too. And you do see a lot of teams around the league with very empty stadiums, you know. And again, I think a campaign like this would be quite encouraging for them to try and endorse. Um, and I, personally, I, I would just like to see Celtic leading the way on this. I know Lawrence has said there that the the, the, the deals that Celtic have, you know, compared to teams in the English Championship is totally different. I, I take that on board. But, you know, if Celtic could lead the way in some part of this, I think it would be a great, um, you know, leading way. And there probably is other ways to, to maximise your, your market and potential. But, but what's your take on this? I think it's a really good step for Reading to be taking. And I do hope other clubs across the league do can I endorse it. Yeah, 100%. I think what they're doing is is brilliant um, and it's certainly the right way forward. Ticket prices and, and the costs of tickets in Scotland and England are getting out of control. We just have to look across Europe to see some of the models over there and how much more affordable and more accessible football is for the fans in other countries. And we absolutely need to ensure that you know, here in Scotland, there in England as well, that football is accessible for the fans and the way it's been priced at the moment is beginning to prevent that. We've all talked about the cost of living crisis. We know it's very difficult at the moment. We know that a lot of people in the country are financially struggling. A football game shouldn't be at the cost that it is to you know, the rest of your finances and the prices are just escalating and escalating. But on the other hand, the clubs are businesses. The clubs are businesses who need to make money and they're pricing the, the tickets at a rate that they think is sustainable to the running of their football club. And as we've seen, you know, you know, Celtic Rangers, Hearts, the fans are still paying it. I would like to see one of the clubs take a stance and try and reduce the, the ticket price. The 20s plenty campaign would be a great way to do it. Would I love Celtic to, to lead the way on that? Absolutely. I mean, it would be great for us for as a club and for everything that we stand for to, to make that step and try and make it more affordable for the fans. I think from a business perspective, the club just won't do that. Um, I can't see it happening. I think that the revenue from the ticket sales is is too much and I don't think any of the other clubs in the league would buy into it either given the way that their finances are too. You know, there's not many, there are no affluent clubs in, in the league really when you look at it. And I think that that comes down to the way that our marketing's handled, the way that we sell the league, the way that we sell the product that is Scottish football, our TV deals, we're not bringing in enough money from that. So what is happening is that the lack of finance there has been subsidised by higher ticket prices. Um, what were we up to for some of the away games last season? Deck? 30, 32 quid. 32, something yeah, like that. I mean, 32, I think, for Aberdeen was maybe... I'm sure one ended up being 36. I could be wrong. Could it might be have wrong. been Hearts. I'm sure one Aberdeen. ended up being 36. So you're looking at that, you know, you're paying £40 for a ticket to a football match. Um you look over in Germany and some of their season tickets are £200, you know, so there's something going wrong here that's costing football fans so much to go to a game. But how you begin to address that, given that the financial position of the clubs, I don't know. Yeah, d- demand as well too, obviously, if you look mm-hmm. at, you know, Celtic Rangers games in isolation, it's 52 quid or whatever it is there. Mm-hmm. I think I was 52 quid for the last game at Ibrox. It's a lot of money for people to shell out for, you know, for mm-hmm. An afternoon going along to football games, but yeah, it'd be nice to see one club in the league take a stance. But I think you know you you both made very good points here, and that they're running as businesses, Lawrence. I think that's a really good point in the pay per view that clubs are going to have a uh, an asset, you know, which I think they they could have went more further forward with um, post COVID. I mean, if you look at their Ross County game that's scheduled for a three o'clock on a Saturday, it's not going to be televised anywhere at all. The Ross County might have got. You know, a good few grand out of that. I had to put it on the old pay-per-view if they were allowed to, but due to the Sky deal, that isn't the case. And again, that's just about marketing Scottish football purely. And Celtic, you know, who are involved in talks aren't the, the person that's marketing uh, the game. So, you know, I think if you probably put some Celtic heads together, they'd probably come up with something a lot better the, than what the package is that the SAFA and the SPFL have sold to Sky. But... Unfortunately, it's a league that we're in. It's the rules that we're under, and we just need to go with it. But yeah, I'd certainly like to see 
Celtic to get a stake on this one. Um, you think about just the TV of, deals? Sorry, yeah, Lawrence. Yeah. I mean, TV, I buy Celtic TV, Virgin, Sky, and Premier Sports. So there's four things I'm paying out for. Celtic TV is ridiculously hard to buy, to navigate your way around and buy it. And I think they can make it easier to buy and improve on it. But I don't think it'll be unique among Celtic fans to the fact I'm paying out for four TV services. No. And I don't feel I'm particularly getting value for money there. It's, so I don't know what. I must pay, pay out about 50 quid a month just on TV to watch Celtic that I don't get to watch all the games on. So th there's, there's definitely a market there for change. I think there's an appetite for change as well because I don't want to just have access to some of the, the Celtic games in, on TV. And I think PP, the pay-per-view and COVID, if any benefit came out of it, it was the opening up of clubs and showing how easy it was for them to put on. Maybe it wasn't, you know, sky level with lines across the pitch for VAR, etc. But still certainly watchable and got you to see the games and I don't know how long the current TV deal's got to, to last but you'd think those clubs would be saying, well, wait a minute, look how much money we're getting, because I don't even it was it 14, 20 quid some of the clubs were charging, you know the way clubs were when we were away, they were charging you just to get the feed but mm -hmm. you, you, you're happy to pay it it's, well I was anyway, but it's so surely they've got to look at how much money do we actually get from TV and, and what's the capability of pay-per-view for us and, and, and something decent, but ho hopefully it's something they're looking at because, you know, four TV deals just now, and I don't think any of them give you a particularly good product. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. And I, again, you know, there's talk around, um, I think Amazon's another one who might be kind of hovering about, so it could be another one. I think that might be for the Champions League or something. So you've got the Champions League and BT Sport. We're going to have your Scottish Premiership games Sky Sports and then your League Cup games uh, and Scottish Cup games and Premier Sports and anything else that you need to, to buy. So, yeah, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of money for people to shell it out and at uh, cost of living crisis when there isn't a lot of money going into their pockets and you need to, you know, balance it. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it's not something at this point in time I can see changing, but uh, it would have been nice had that, that pay-per-view steaming continued on just so we could get anxious. I think, you know, for this Ross County game is going to be one of the, the prime examples of that. And again, from Celtic fans, we're lucky that, you know, majority of our games are shown on television, but there's clubs up and down the country and there'll be fans for whatever reason can't get along to games, whether it's work commitments or health issues. And, you know, they probably can't watch their team and can't get along. So, yeah, um, another one for a different day. But Natasha, can you give us a wee update on the, the Celtic women's team? Because I know there's been a couple of people out the door. Yeah, there has. There's been um, a good bit of turnover in the women's team over the the transfer window. Um, I think one of the things you see in the women's game compared to the men's game for the people who don't watch it so much is that there is quick turnover of players. Players don't tend to stay at a club for as long as they do in the men's game for a variety of reasons. So from last season's squad, um, for example, this um, window we've we've lost Shane Shorts, um, Maria Gross, Today, Tyler Toland, Dizzy Atkinson left, Chloe Warrington's already left, Rebecca McAllister's gone. Um, so there has been a good amount of turnover during the transfer window. And saying that, probably the only regular starter out of all them was Shane Shorts. Um, she'll be a big miss, very good player. To an extent, Izzy Atkinson as well was always a good option. She came on and scored that goal um, against Glasgow City in the cup final, which won us the cup double. So she'll always be remembered for that. But, you know, the squad's getting quite thin. Um, it is getting cut down and cut down. So I would imagine that we'll start to see some signings coming in. Hopefully Fran is, is under control on that one because at the moment, the squad's starting to look a little bit threadbare. So I'd imagine before the season starts, we'll start to see more players um, coming into the, the Celtic women's team. But I think one of the key issues in that department is budget and finances. We need to properly support the women's team, get them the budget that they need um, to bring in the players and attract the players from some of the top teams around Europe and in England um, and make a proper go of the league this season. I think that will really be Fran's ambition. Last season, we finished third in the league, but we were a, a bit of a way off Glasgow City and Rangers Winning the cup double was absolutely fantastic, historic for the club, but I'm sure it will absolutely be Fran's ambition to be in more of a title race this season. But to do that, we do need to start, you know, building that squad up again and replacing some of the players that we've lost. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, I think for Ange Postecoglou, 
and Fran Alonso, very you know interesting seasons. You know both did well, success, um, but it's how you build on that. And, and again, mm-hmm. it's going to be really interesting to see how how that goes on. Obviously, Celtic a uh, women's team two cups in the bag last year. It was a historic season. How do you go and, and build on it next? So interesting to see there's movement there. There's obviously movement with the first team. I'd be interested to see how both uh, Fran and Ange get on. Um, and it seems as if it could be a a play at the, the pavilion, Laura, isn't it, Fran and Ange or something? But um, we'll, we'll see how both men get on. Um, Lawrence, just, you know, I think in a, a total summary here, we're seeing people going out the door, we're seeing people arrive. But I think we're still all very, you know, for me anyway, relaxed about this transfer window so far. I think we're getting business done, we're ticking things off, as Natasha said earlier on, and we don't need to worry about Champions League qualifiers at this point in time. Are you still pretty relaxed and happy, cool about everything? Angie's third transfer window, his first two have been pretty flawless, as far as I can see. So I think that buys you a lot of credit, doesn't it? Yeah. So Michael Nicholson's third transfer window, and it, again, he seems to have been stepping up to the mark. So, yeah, the, you know, the, the, there's trust builds that these two guys seem to be able to, to work together well and bring in the targets that they want. So, yeah, fairly relaxed, as Natasha put it out. There's, there's a long way to, to go before we kick a ball in anger. So, yeah, we've got time to do what we need to do. Listen, if the club can get somebody to take Barca, surely we can get the other people moved on as well. It's just, you know, that's the one player you probably thought nobody's touching him. But, you know, if he, if they can move him, you know, there's hope for Sorrow, a Yeti in Bongoli. Yeah. Well, there's um, there's plenty of movement there. Natasha, you're still pretty relaxed about all this. I think that we did business very well and um, it's just about continuing to do that well and... You know, I think we've got every faith and confidence in Ange Postecoglou, and Michael Nicholson, and everybody working behind the scenes at Celtic. That if we need a player to come in, we'll probably get that player. Yeah, I think the the difference we find ourselves in in this transfer window is, firstly, you know, we're not panicking about the close proximity of the Champions League qualifiers and going in underprepared with a makeshift back four and, you know, someone playing our position. We don't have that kind of stress this year, which is a very new position for us to be in. So, you know, we do have that sort of benefit of time and, you know, start of the season, you know, isn't just around the corner. I mean, especially for me, it feels like a mile away. I'm desperate to get it back and it feels like forever. Um, but we do have time, which is good from a transfer perspective. And I think the other thing that's different about this transfer window is that we're not so nervous about who the club are bringing in like we've touched on there's been a good really good couple of transfer windows recently um you go back to the ones before that and you know you're talking about you know 50 60 percent of them not quite working out and you're looking at who we've brought in or who Andrew and michael nicholson have brought in during their reign and their transfer window and you're thinking brilliant you know they're we're talking about maybe a percentage rate of 80, 90% of them working. And the ones that didn't, I'm not particularly sure would have been Angie's idea in the first place. But I think that's what Angie's done. He's given us the confidence that what they're doing in the transfer market is the right move for the club and the players that we're bringing in are taking us a step forward, um, that we're not downsizing. Um, I think we could have been criticised for that in previous campaigns. But this season... Um, and under Ange so far, I've seen absolutely no indication of downsizing, no indication that we're selling our better players and replacing them with risks. What I'm seeing here is that we're building and building and building, and that's the direction I want to see the club going in, and that's the direction I see us going in during this transfer window. So for me, very content with the way it's going. Yeah, I'm very content at this point in time too. Um, and again, it's going to be nice to see Celtic back in action tomorrow, Lawrence. But what kind of team are you expecting? I expect quite a hybrid team and probably, you know, change halves. You, you can't take much from these pre-season friendlies. But I do think you'll see some first-team regulars are returning, obviously. Majority of the international guys only returned to training uh, j- just there. But, um, yeah, I think you'll see probably a bit, a bit of a mixture here, which is exciting too, to see some of the younger guys come into the team and, and play alongside the kind of first-team players. Yeah, d- definitely. You'd expect to see lots of changes during the game, wouldn't you? Maybe see, I don't know what's happening with Urigidi and Wall. See them, see the new faces. Or come on, maybe Segris might get a half over heart. See the Argentinian boy get a few minutes. It's, it's as relaxed as we've been getting into pre season or at the beginning of the season in as long as I can remember. Because you're, you're thinking, you know, we've, we've got things covered here. You know, but I suppose that the thing, a bit of disagreement on, we're talking about a defensive midfielder striker, but we do have options in both positions at the moment. It's not, 
Like last, last season, we were we were thread bearing going. He's you know who's going to play where? Where are we going to pull a player for to play in that position? So it'd be great to see them play. See what kind of shape they're in. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully get a win. You know, even though it's only a friendly, you still want to win, don't you? Yeah, we want to win every game, especially when we're going to be playing Rapid Vienna and the Joe also yeah. another final. Who set up that Rapid Vienna game? Jeez. You well, know. we've played it before in pre-season friendly, so I think people have uh, kind of forgotten about our uh, adventures with them in the nineteen eighties. But um, yeah, they, they wouldn't have been my um, wouldn't have been my pick for a pre-season friendly. But yeah, I think if we can replicate the the, the famous three 0 victory against the Jaworso and Arthur's game, that would also be nice. Just talk about him possibly pulling on the hoops once again. Um, there seems to be a bit of bad feeling around that Legia game at the moment. I don't know if you've been following their their ultras issues with the game, um, but they put out a statement yesterday or the day before, which then was supported by Artur. Um, I think, you know, it was obviously all in Polish, but from what I can work out, I think it seems to be around the, the ticketing prices. I think Legia have come off the back of a very bad season for them, and we're hoping that this game either might be free or, or very reduced as a way of, you know, Apology to the fans and a nice way to send Arthur off from his time at the club. Um, and I think the ticket prices are very high. I think apparently it's something of the equivalent of £50, £60 pounds to get into this game. So, you know, what we were talking about, accessibility, it's just not that. And I think Arthur's come out and said he's embarrassed by it as well. And that if people don't want to go, then watch it at home. They don't need to go. Um, so it's a bit of a shame for him that the club have, you know, perhaps tainted or been detrimental to, to his send off from Legia Warsaw, but he is obviously an absolute legend. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the crowd does look like at that game given these ticketing issues. Yeah, I've been to see how many Celtic fans get the, the visit over because it wouldn't be yeah. one I'd uh, certainly fancy getting to. But anyway, um, plenty of games coming up for Celtic. We'll be back in pre season action. I'm looking forward to getting back to Celtic Park and not too far in the future to see his. Um, back in action uh, against Norwich and Blackburn so looking forward to that it'll be great to have games to talk about and have a look at players again thanks everybody for watching today if you have been watching please do like the video if you haven't already subscribed to the channel please do 